good morning, everybody. A warm welcome again. I'm naturally very honored to speak to such a professional and also hopefully critical audience. Then, as you can imagine, it's always wonderful to get a feedback on such a project that has occupied me uh, for the last uh, roughly two years. Um, before I start with the presentation, which will basically give some insight on the conception of the present show, but also on the show that was before seen at Fondation Weiler in Basel, I would like to give a kind of a personal statement to my approach as a curator. And maybe that explains also the certain differences to the approach of Thea Bach. I'm a strong believer that an uh, exhibition stands for itself. I think an exhibition has to speak very directly, and in the end, it's not me, it's the artwork I'm entrusted with that speaks very directly uh, to the viewer. And therefore, uh, it is very important to me that an exhibition, be it sculpture, be it painting, it doesn't matter, it always needs to grow, grow into space. So I'm definitely not a curator who just comes with a concept, then starts amassing works of art, and in the end kind of tries to fit them into kind of a building. This is important to state, uh, above all in a show that was conceived for... <coughs> the stick doesn't work. Uh, that was conceived for two buildings that are entirely different. You see just as a trailer, uh, two installation shots of the making of Brancusi Serra here in Bilbao, uh, when we place the pedestals. Also, this is something very crucial. As you know, we are forced to use pedestal. We have to use security platforms, which unfortunately is not always in favor of sculpture, but this is just the security measure imposed by the lenders. Uh, however, we can underscore, uh, I put a lot of energy to get all the vitrines, or nearly all the vitrines away, which is also something that hinders totally sculpture to unfold in space. So it's a long way of preparation, and also the, the spacing of pedestals, their volume by itself, is crucial in the way we perceive um, an exhibition. So, however, um, it was conceived for two different buildings, and they couldn't be more different. On the left, you see the Bayer Foundation, which is a rectangular um, museum. It had a very clear flow, that's the entrance. You, we started in the main lobby. It began here with the kisses, continued on. It was kind of a parkour back uh, to the very culminating point with the other birds. So when the project came, and it came actually very early on, that um, the director of Guggenheim, New York, Richard Armstrong, at some very informal uh, coffee, said to me, what are you up? And I said, I'm actually doing a Brancusi show. And then I added, actually, Brancusi, Richard Serra show. He said, well, if you ever get this done, I would like this show to be seen in Bilbao. The building here is entirely different. It is organized around this central uh, uh, lobby that we have seen yesterday. And uh, the, the spaces are kind of central petal around it, so it was not just a, 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 an adaptation, we had to kind of completely rethink uh, the project for here. And I must say, I'm very, very pleased the way um, this exhibition has grown into that building. But going back to the original idea, it is important um, to state that it began as a Brancusi exhibition. It was mentioned by Marta that it actually came out of this project uh, with tribal art. Um, I had the luck there to uh, get a loan from a private collection. It's unfortunately not traveled to Bilbao of a sleeping muse. And this wonderful loan and actually the wonderful friendship that developed with the collectors uh, kind of uh, engaged me to say, well, would you lend again if we try to make a little Brancusi exhibition? As you might understand, and it was pointed out yesterday by uh, Petra Jos, uh, it's always been the same museums in the past who did Brancusi exhibition. And since 1995, uh, 1955, this is actually only the fifth time we see a small retrospective. So doing a Brancusi exhibition is, in a way, to use a Swiss term of watchmaking, une grande complexité, a, a big complexity, it's actually sheer impossible because the works are extremely fragile, they're extremely precious, there are only very few, about 340 works altogether. Uh, the, most of the important works are still in the United States because the early collecting was 
American and so the work stayed there. There are still a big portion of important works in private hands, quite phenomenal. And then the other part is kept in the Centre Georges Pompidou, in the Brancusi studio, which certainly you know, outside the Centre Pompidou. Uh, and this is literally not lendable. It's declared non-lendable, so it's very hard to convince our colleagues in Paris to, to move one or two pieces out of this studio, uh, so doing a Brancusi exhibition by itself is nearly impossible. But looking at Brancusi, and I did this looking through his own photographs, and looking the way it's being presented today in museum, I very instantly felt something is lacking. And evidently, the artist is dead. He's not here any longer. So what Thea Bach outlines is kind of reconfiguring the body of his work in kind of rearranging the studio constantly. That's gone. And if you see the studio today, as charmingly this reconstruction is, it's trapped like an aquarium. It's in a way a dead place. And this kind of atmosphere of which Richard Serra speaks in a very uh, direct way, it smelled like art. Uh, this is actually gone. The smell has kind of evaporated. To this comes that many Brancusi sculptures suffer from uh, super protective conservation. So in the past, in the 50s and 60s, his rotten down wood, for instance, has been uh, sanded, it was lacquered, it has been conserved. Cracks that he deliberately used in his kind of creating contrast were filled in. Uh, some of the bases actually look like plastified. So the work by itself has radically changed. This is also true for the bronzes. Um, Brancusi used to polish the bronzes and, and naturally with the natural oxidation they obtain a very beautiful golden glow. Today, most American museums, and this is also true for some of the loans in the exhibition, they repolish the bronzes and then they dip them in some acrylic lacquer uh, to prevent them from oxidating. So they have to repolish them only about every 10 years. The result is, and this is very unfortunate, uh, these bronzes look like a cheap uh, brass trumpet. So they have something rather kitschy to it. And I'm happy to quote and to underscore Richard Serra definitely doesn't like and never liked the Polish bronzes. I think it's a misunderstanding, but that's his own right. But part of that also comes because these bronzes became, uh, due to this kind of methods of conservation, uh, as he calls it, an objet de luxe, uh, a kind of a fetish for the rich, uh, which definitely was uh, not the intention of the artist. So in my very beginning of this Brancusi show, I felt something is missing, it needs a counterpoint. And out of this intuitive feeling of creating a counterpoint came this idea to juxtapose it with the work of Richard Serra. I honestly admit, when that was proposed to Fondation Bayler and my director kind of with some startling of, well, why Serra? I said, well, that's just why. It's the only possible artist I could think of, and it makes perfectly sense to me. I then did not know that Richard Serra, as a student, or more student than artist in 64, 65, had actually discovered the Brancusi studio, that he had been drawing uh, excessively the sculpture, and at the end, and that's something he still adheres to today, 40 years later, um, or nearly 50 years later, um, uh, he became a sculptor. So Richard Serra, in a way, uh, draw, dwells his own doing in sculpture back on this experience of drawing Brancusi, but this came only later. But naturally, it underscored my kind of feelings from the gods that these two go together and that they might be juxtaposed in an open way. And this is maybe the approach which I would like to give as a red thread if you go, you saw this show yesterday, but you will certainly see it again today, if you encounter the show today. It was definitely not my intention to create ideal pairings, because I think this would be much too limitating. Uh, certainly, and I will uh, explain some of it, uh, there are certain moments where I kind of had a certain idea why I put certain things together. Other things, and that's also an important thing in curating generally, you have to listen to intuition. Sometimes it's pure chance, luck, that brings a certain loan and gives you a certain uh, uh, configuration that otherwise would not be possible. So that's true also in this project. And then definitely there are moments where we have a sequence of works, meaning we have a Brancusi room followed by a Richard Serra piece, 
uh, and sometimes we have moments where they are directly juxtaposed. This was a leading principle for both places in Basel and in Bilbao. Uh, as you see from the ground floors, um, we had to adapt it. Uh, the Bilbao spaces, uh, for instance, we have these classical galleries, the square galleries, which seem to be the ones that are actually easy for sculpture. They prove to be the more difficult one. So certain Richard Serra pieces have been uh, replaced. Uh, I choose an other piece that really fit into the space harmonically instead of adapting the space to fit in a piece that would not have uh, worked well here. Um, then we have these kind of, sorry, we have these kind of uh, amorphous spaces and as you have seen yesterday, these are actually simply ideal for sculpture because they have this kind of limitless quality, these curved walls like in a photographic studio and there are ideally to actually render a quality physically present that Brancusi names in his uh, titles, the bird in space. So actually the space around it is to be referred as a part of the sculpture. And I think that is something of the most <coughs> successful here in, 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 the, in the building. Then uh, to end with this kind of uh, floor plans, definitely the exhibition had also a, a, a parkour here, as it had in the Bayer. It starts in this little chapel-like space above the matter of time, because I feel this is a real obligation. It is one of the grandest pieces to date Richard Serra has realized for an interior of a museum, uh, and I thought it's certainly simply logic to, to start um, at this point, and then it goes counterclockwise uh, into the spaces and ends, culminates, as in Basel, in the space with the birds in space. It was also important for me that you have viewpoints. So if you stand here, you view into the gallery with the sleeping muses. You have a kiss here that refers down to the matter of time. In this niche that really calls for a sculpture, we have the Danaid by Brancusi. And finally, coming up the ramp, you have an ideal point where you face the Maestro uh, from Brancusi again. So kind of that the real exhibition also enfolds into the entire space of this museum and doesn't just stay in this ephemeral space uh, grouped around the central axis. So let me start with a kind of virtual tour through the two shows. You see it as it began at the Bayern Museum. It started with a kiss room, so there was nothing else than four kisses. And that's another important thing. How do you organize such a juxtaposition that in the end is a very personal approach to the two works of these sculptures? Naturally, I need to give a certain logic and a certain guidance to a general public. So the guidance in this respect lies in the fact that actually you have three things. You have a Brancusi retrospective, you have a Richard Serra retrospective, and in the end you have Brancusi and Serra seen together. So to give a certain logic in the organization, I try to make consistent groupings. If for me, it was very important uh, in terms of Frank Husey not to show all the variations of his topics. He had about 15 different topics to which he returned lifelong. I choose some of these, but then try to make consistent groupings. So I choose the cases, but I try to show them in depth. So we have a time span from 1907 to now about 1923. Um, in terms of Richard Serra too, I tried to choose some of his seminal work so that we have a comprehensive grouping of lead props, so that we have one of his best, or actually the best, early work in rubber, which is the belts uh, owned by the Guggenheim uh, Panzer Collection in New York. Um, that was a very important moment so that there's a certain consistency. I, however, did not uh, organize the works strictly chronological because that would have meant it would start with the sleeping child's head in plaster, which is dated 1906, and would be the earliest work in the exhibition. I tried to keep the groupings or the topic of the groupings as units and together, so that this gives a certain uh, visual structure into this entire doing. So here you see uh, the uh, work in Bilbao. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of the, of the sculpture standing outside, leading down to the matter of time. You certainly want to know, well, why do I juxtapose uh, specifically the kisses with the matter of time? There may be two reasons. 
First, as you have seen in, in the speech of Thea Bach, the kiss motif is something crucially important to Brancusi, and it also leads to monumentality. It cannot be really displayed in an exhibition because we cannot borrow the kiss gate, we can also not borrow the kiss column, uh, we can even not borrow certain uh, um, pedestals that kind of explain how this motif is developed into something monumental. But definitely Brancusi has a very strong monumental quality in his work early on, and that is one of the reasons why I think it's appropriate that the kiss is phased down to the matter of time. On another more intimate uh, view, I think uh, it's also uh, a, a time piece because uh, the kiss is kind of like an eternal monument to love. It's like an eternal embracement. So there is actually also the time factor in it. And if you go down onto the level of the matter of time, we actually ar arranged a small video booth where for the first time outside Paris, we can screen some fragments of the films we knew of Brancusi, but they have only been released this year to the Centre Pompidou. They were not accessible mm -hmm. since the, the artist died. And there you actually see Brancusi filming his own sculpture, and you actually see like a proof that he was really also experimenting with movement. So sculpture is in movement, or he moves around the sculpture, or the sculpture moves and you have all the reflections and different um, light impressions. So it's, you have this quality of movement as a demonstration. So that is the kind of uh, beginning in the Bilbao situation. If we go on, we have two views of the Bayer Museum. It's the second room. Uh, the whole thing is informed by this grouping. The Little French Girl and the Cup are original pieces. The column here has been carved by a sculptor and art handle of the Bayer Museum is a modern reconstruction. The whole thing is based on a piece that Brancusi had suggested to his first and foremost collector, John Quinn, with the title uh, L'Enfant au Monde, Group Mobile, The Child in the World, Mobile Group. Um, and you see this kind of very intriguing cup. It's something that you, if you would look at all the photographs Brancusi made of the studio, you would see it again and again. Um, the cup is like a regular cup. You drink your morning coffee just enlarged. So for me, the idea of a found form that becomes art or is kind of transposed into the context of art was the leading principle to um, juxtapose it with this found material by Richard Serra. To explain it a little further, because otherwise we don't understand it, we have to know that Brancusi was very befriended with Eric Satie, and they nicknamed <coughs> each other as Socrates for Satie and Platon for Brancusi. So this whole thing is not just a kind of a, a, a top playing around, it's a philosophical sculpture. So you have the, the I, the philosopher who controls everything, Socrates, uh, who is kind of dominating the world from the top of this endless column. It would actually be the first endless column we see in Brancusi's uh, oeuvre. And down, the, the child is Platon, evidently the ph philosophical child of this uh, 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 uber-philosoph, um, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Socrates or Platon descending from Socrates. And then, naturally, this kind of found form becomes an evident symbol. It's simply the beaker of hemlock Socrates was forced to, uh, to drink and to kill himself. So that is the kind of this idea, and since the ready-made is occupied by Duchamp, I permitted myself to baptize it, baptize it a pre-ready-made. So this pre-ready-made, this found <coughs> form versus found material, that's the simple juxtaposition. And then maybe to refer back to something that has already been raised in our previous discussion, it's also naturally the idea of materiality, found material. Brancusi was in love of old wood and he wanted it old, cracking with all the worms in it and not being polished and sanded and lacquered as unfortunately it has happened in the past uh, 40 years through kind of excessive uh, conservation. You see the same configuration here in Bilbao. Uh, a, a contrary to Basel, since the room is so monumental, uh, we added in other early wood pieces, and it's culminating actually in a late work in the Kings of the King, uh, in the same space which you see at the very end here. 
And again, uh, what I mean is curating, I pose the sculpture in a way, if you enter it in a sensitive way, you will see he starts looking at you. So I didn't just place it that you see through the white, but I placed it the way Brancusi would have placed it if you carefully watch his photographs, and then actually the sculpture gets kind of eyes through the kind of way the hollows have been put. Then the next is again the Weiler. Uh, that's all about um, this kind of um, resting in space, as I would name it. It's about child's head or kind of ovoid volumes, be it child's head or uh, sleeping muses, uh, that are not, it's for me, it's not something that is static, because you literally feel how these kind of ovoids have been kind of finding their inner balance. So there already we can understand that a lot in Brancusi is about movement. In Basel, this was juxtaposed with a piece which is absent here. It's also a kind of a work of the mid-80s, the beginning of this kind of double curves, leaning very precariously out of balance. So there too, it's not a static resting. It's something very dynamic that potentially could change in the very next moment. So that is the very open way uh, to see these two. Here in Bilbao, this whole room, you see another view of it in the backwards part. For me, actually, it was very interesting to see how such a little volume, such a kind of tiny little head, if you give it more space, how it actually can hold up to such a monumental sculpture of Richard Serra. Here we have the situation in Bilbao. As I said before, certain things um, are born out of necessities, of coincidence, um, it was not foreseen to hang the black paintings, this kind of masses resting in space with the child's head. That just came because uh, Richard Serra had insisted, he gave me more or less entire freedom, but he had insisted on a very specific piece here in Bilbao, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's this kind of star form, which was supposed to go with the bird's room. I was never really convinced about this juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. So at the very last moment, which was more or less end of June, early July, when I came here for a last kind of meeting to uh, fine tune the pedestals, I decided this is not going to look good and I think this piece actually would work much better in a square room. So we had to relocate the, the, the drawings that were in the last square room and the only place to put them were the child's head. So it's a, it's a total random thing, I bluntly admit it. It's just born out of chance, and to be honest with you, it's one of the spaces here, of the configurations here in Bilbao, that I find the most successful. The next is again the Weiler. Uh, there we have more possibilities of sequential order. So it starts with the two blocks, it goes over with the two negresses, the negresse blanche and the negresse blonde, and it culminates, you see it already there, with the delineator. This is another piece which we didn't bring to Bilbao simply because it would not have worked well with the given space here. Uh, and you see the delineator here. The idea there is the kind of force field, meaning Sarah who poses two blocks and with that activates the empty space in between or actually makes the empty space in between part of the sculpture. This can be two blocks or it can be delineated as you see it. And Brancusi in a different, as I said, it was made to be a contrast. I wanted visual contrast. Brancusi in a different but still similar way, the resting sleeping head of the muse is put in an upright position, vertical, perfect kind of egg shape standing up. And with this kind of sharp cut contour, it actually starts in a very dramatic way to activate the space around it. Here in Bilbao, the configuration had to be different. Um, when I started working for the second venue in Bilbao, I actually thought, well, this museum is way bigger, it's, it's kind of gigantic, so definitely it's the better playground for Richard Serra. We can maybe bring in one of his very, very heavy sculptures of the recent days, which can weigh up to 300 tons. Uh, that was quite wrong. The building here is much more limited than the Byler. Um, uh, we had to meet specific static points. It took quite some engineering to actually really make the, the transfer of the two blocks to bits of Bilbao possible. Um, so naturally, given that, the configuration here is different. So we don't have the sequence we had in Basel, which I liked in a way better. It was more logic to see it in sequence. Uh, so it kind of juxtaposed 
which is maybe a little bit more abrupt, more radical, however it still works. Uh, next is, this, is again at the Bayer Gallery, uh, we have the House of Cards in the center of uh, what I would say a very academic in the end or classic topic. It's the bust of a, a female bust, like the bust of portraiture. It's all about the bending of a female neck, the graciousness of this form. And there I actually adhere to some observation of Richard Serra. Uh, he points out that actually it's fascinating to see how Brancusi organizes his sculptures always around an, an, an invisible vertical axis, this kind of twisting, turning upwards. And that's uh, all what it's about, the House of Cards, which is in a way the, the beginning of Sarah going monumental. We have these four uh, slabs of lead that tend to fall simultaneously and by that hold themselves up. They overlap a little bit, and in this have also this kind of informing principle of a vertical axe in between, around which this whole piece is structurally kind of uh, conceived and organized. Another view from Basel, and here you have the view uh, in Bilbao. Unfortunately, I didn't have the image at hand where you see also the House of Cards. Then, as I mentioned before, um, the space is here, and sometimes really call for a sculpture. So um, we had a long, long negotiation with the Kunstmuseum Winterthur, who at the beginning did not want to travel on the Brancusi to Bilbao. Imagine they naturally are out of the Brancusi for nearly a year, which is quite a, a sacrifice. So I needed a lot of conviction to finally make the Danaid possible, because I really wanted this specific work in this niche, not just any kind of other Brancusi. It needed to be this kind of wonderful sphere. It, I wanted this wonderful base, which also, in a way, engenders this kind of uh, organization around the vertical axis. Going back, we come to the Bayer Gallery again. Um, we have a selection of torso. Um, Thea Bach has mentioned it. Uh, I think here you see a quality that actually also was mentioned in the spontaneous talk yesterday by the two artists. They named it graphic quality in Brancusi. Richard Serra speaks of drawing volume, that he was fascinated the way Brancusi is drawing volume. And I think that's about uh, the main uh, moment I would stress, and if I could give an undertitle, or if I could change the undertitle of the exhibition or the book, it would definitely be drawing volume, because I think it, it reflects very clearly and very significantly to, bo to both of the artists. You see the very clear-cut, sharp contour, and you see the radical cut, how Brancusi, in a way, very radical, radically defines this kind of uh, quality. And there we have Richard Serra, his first monumental piece from 1969-71, uh, Strike, just a simple uh, slab of steel standing out in a 45-degree angle from the corner, uh, where you have this radical cut through space, through our bodily own experience. So that's where I think the artists actually come uh, the most closest without really enforcing them to an ideal pairing. For Bilbao, we changed the configuration simply because the museum is too big. Strike is a relatively uh, subtle sculpture. It's only seven meters long. So placing Strike in this big room, it would have just been lost. It would have been actually very wrong. But uh, luckily, Richard Serra, based on Strike, did another very important historic piece that was presented in 1972 at the Documenta in Kassel, which was circuit. So that was the ideal piece for the square galleries here. So we just replaced it by a work that is the same spirit, this kind of radical cut to our physical integrity, uh, but really working beautifully with the building. Then again, and that's kind of the compromises you have to do, the two torsos, the others didn't make it to Bilbao, but they are sufficient to understand the thought. They have to be placed in the next gallery, so uh, naturally, ideally, we would have another space in between, but we have to adapt to certain givens of the architecture. And then the piece I spoke of, which was meant to be with the birds, so that has been relocated on its own in this square gallery, and here I think it makes a perfect logic to strike. Strike was kind of 
highlighting this kind of narrow passage, this threshold in the middle, whereas this piece is kind of inverting that idea. So there is a space which we actually not access, which we don't even really see around which this piece is organized. So it's kind of the whole dynamic of the, of the room going inwards, here goes outwards. Then, uh, again, Byler, you see, we put the Maestro high up. That comes uh, from the historic of the piece. It was owned by Edward Steichen, and he himself, with Brancusi, had placed it on a small pedestal high up in his garden. <coughs> it's a mythical bird. It's not a bird that starts to fly. It's more a bird that uh, dominates the, the things on Earth, that kind of is superior on every earthly thing. So that's why it has to throw above uh, our own sphere, and that's why it needs high pedestals. And then the last room at the Byler, you see the birds, the bird platforms, and there you see actually, if I'm, I mean, as much as I like the museum, I'm having the pleasure to work, you see the ceiling here is very disturbing. It kind of lowers uh, the flight. It hinders the, the, this kind of elan of the birds to go away, which is, I think, the most uh, dramatically impact what we have here at the Guggenheim Bilbao, this huge volume that really gives the space these works need. And that too maybe was an informing uh, principle of my whole doing. If you may be record or remember the exhibition that was done in 1995 at the Centre Georges Pompidou, which was the Brancusi exhibition ever. We will never see such a thing again. Still, I have mixed feelings about it. There was simply too much. It was all jammed onto one platform. There's this kind of fixation that we have to recreate a studio, which in the end we cannot recreate. And I think they tend to forget that these sculptures are kind of uh, energies on their own that can also be seen with their space around it and that deserve kind of a certain <coughs> distinct emptiness to really enfold their real power. Um, to finish, because I think this is something important, you definitely would like to know how these things or this show come into place. So I just show you some images how uh, you conceive. As I said, Richard Serra is an artist who wants to maintain the physical contact with his work. So also the real placing of his sculptures into the building is calculated by engineers. He insists to kind of see how it works in the space. And he usually also insists to be physically present when works are moved. So you see us here at the Byler, kind of discussing the layout, uh, placing the sculpture into space, and actually you have to imagine the museum is in constant use, so we have partition walls that are set up, the space was divided up, so it's not that easy to really define such a placement if the space is not totally empty, but that's the way it has to go. Then you see uh, Olsen that came from far away. It's been stored. It's a piece that the artist regards as crucially important, so it's still in his own uh, collection. It's stored in New Jersey, so it came uh, by transatlantic shipment to Antwerp and was then shipped on the Rhine River with the wonderful boat called the Repo Ailleurs to the port in Basel uh, to arrive finally at our museum with some surprises. And then, um, now have you a the film on, just press again. No. Yes. Sorry, because you see a small, Richard Terra was so happy working at the Weiler and actually also here at the Guggenheim that he gave special permission, but he usually does not, that we film the process of moving the piece. Now we just have to get it technically to work. Ah. Right, so it works. Well, while we try, I just explain to you. So the piece is lifted on this kind of sledges. You see these small <coughs> things underneath. It's about the 50 by 50 centimeter um, surface of. Um, uh, a, a kind of air caution and with hydraulic uh, air with hydraulic air um, the um, the whole piece is moved into into the building no. 
Then once you see the building, uh, you see the whole floor is rebuilt, and the, um, the sculpture is hanging from this kind of uh, scaffolding or yoke, and you see these red things that are little pumps, so with that you lift it actually up, and then um, all the wood underneath is removed, and then it slides down gradually. It was very important in our building to let it down absolutely horizontal because of the point load. If it would have been uh, not horizontal, we would have had 13 tons on one point. The whole floor would have broken down. It only worked really with this um, very precise lowering down. That uh, actually took more than a day for each plate, just to give you a certain idea of what it means to bring Sarah. Then at the Bailo we had a piece that is not in Bilbao, which worked beautifully with our building, Fernando Pessoa, 43 tons heavy. Um, we had to unbuild the facade in the end of the <coughs> corridor. We had to temporarily close our main entrance and create a kind of a new entrance. We are not supposed to be ever closed. That is a wish of our founder, which we naturally respect. Um, as you see, uh, to date, the floor was holly. We did not even put a nail into it, but there was no other way. The engineer made a, cal a calculation mistake, and Richard Serra really, at the end, when the mistake was revealed, he insisted that a Pessoa comes to the show. So we had to find another uh, solution. So we had to unbuild all our climate control system. We placed in a kind of a, like a street of four centimeters six steel plates standing on little metal posts that go directly down to the concrete ceiling. Uh, and then you see uh, Fernando Pessoa being slided in, 43 tons on eight of these air cartons, then pushed into position, uh, naturally resting on two steel supports because it could not stand on the wood floor, and then the wood has been built in back. So the simple perfection, and with this I would actually like to end. We were asked and um, it was this discussion about materiality and about kind of um, transcending materiality. Uh, I definitely had heard that I think Richard Serra is based to matter. He doesn't want to be transcending. So it's not Brancusi with kind of his words <coughs> who has nearly a, a kind of a religious uh, transcendence into space of, of material quality. I think uh, Richard Serra wants to be earthbound. However, and definitely he will probably uh, uh, contradict a work like this in its sheer simplicity, in its sheer way, with this kind of one side that is kind of a real shock blocking us out, and the other side that becomes a very sublime, uh, small vertical lifting up. He also achieves something that in a way has a transcending quality, and I think this is also um, the, the important moment in the matter of time here, uh, as apart from the monumentality, the sheer bodily feeling that we have being lost in these kind of corridors of steel and forms and tipping over, it has also something that is really, uh, in the proper word, uh, eternal. And so in a way, maybe the work of the later Sarah, of the Sarah of today, willing or not willing, achieves a certain closeness in that respect to Brancusi as well. With this, I would like to end, uh, that we have uh, still some uh, moments for the discussion um, to see, um, but I hope you understood why the show is the way it is. I definitely did not want to enforce ideal pairings. I think both artists have to be seen in their own right but it's still very interesting to see them kind of overlap, to dialogue, to contrast in a show that brings them close without putting too much kind of, of enforcement on the real body of work. Thank you very much.